So good morning, everybody, and thanks to QO2 for the invita invitation. And this morning, I will uh, talk to you about an experiment, an experimental project that we have been undertaking in Brussels for the past 20 years. This experiment consists of creating a sound history and a sound memory of the city through, firstly, the voices, the stories, memories, and experiences of its inhabitants. This happens by interviewing and recording testimonials and conversations. And secondly, through the sounds of the city, for instance, uh, the soundscapes and field recordings. It is in fact by uh, systematically archiving the voices and sounds of the present that we work on the elaboration of a collective memory of the city in which everyone can participate in a personal manner, independent of any uh, sort of selection. In this process, we pose the sound as a history and a history as a statement, as a story, uh, rather than a fact. So uh, why, why uh, do we do this? First of all, to multiply the ways of making and telling history as inclusively as possible by inviting everyone to actively participate and exercise their narrative using the voice. The history we make is a local history. Sorry. It's a local history, it could be called a micro-history, and it is made of grains of voice uh, and narrative fragments recounting the everyday from the point of view of the everyday life. Uh, while there are indeed uh, uh, sound archives, a few of them are part of the daily Brussels, and we want to fill this gap by collecting testimonies of ordinary people with low audibility and visibility on the public stage. The project evolves in parallel as a counterpoint to a classical constru construction of history. Uh, now, why sound? Uh, why do we focus on the sonic medium? The sound is considered here as a major vector of history. Uh, not only does it keep specific information on a variety of topics, but it also catches the nuances and the unspoken specificities of language. To speak, uh, uh, be it an everyday or a strategic context, is always a unique and a singular exercise, because each voice contains its on cultural, anthropological, and sociological indicators, lapses, imperfections, hesitations, accents, silence, uh, all these things uh, that are generally uh, omitted or left out of a transcription. Uh, so being interested in the words and stories of people is not just being in, in interested in what is or is not being said, but also in the way in which it is or is not being said. Uh, in addition, it's about a desire and an attempt uh, to, com to complete a documentary corpus that is largely dominated by written text and images. Uh, the sound medium makes it possible to take into account an infravisible uh, reality that is hyper-personal and closest to who expresses it. How do we proceed in this? Our uh, methodology is participative and it uh, consists both of uh, spontaneous collections and thematic collections. And those collections, they are done uh, either by amateurs uh, or by professionals. They rely uh, on an individual initiative or are subject to a structured process and are realized either by our team or uh, uh, in cooperation with other organizations, museums, or events, and they can be part of socio-artistic productions, workshops, comments, radio broadcasts, and so on. I will give, um, I will give a couple of examples uh, later on. Um, as you can see here, there are a lot of combination, uh, of possible combination in uh, our methodology, 
And um, for example, if you take the the first um, elements you see on the uh, all the elements you see on the first row, and you combine all these uh, elements, you have a, a specific methodology. Um, that uh, that consists of, uh, for example, dispatching microphones uh, in the public or in uh, certain communities and to uh, teach them how to record and to let them uh, record themselves or, uh, they or anyone else. So that's a, 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 a one kind of um, a methodology. Um, but all these... Um, uh, recordings would remain uh, vulnerable without a con concerted effort to uh, archive them properly. And the archiving happens in two different ways, on a classical way, by uh, re sorry, rigorously preserving all the recorded material um, on durable formats uh, that are systematically upgraded. We would call this first this first way of archiving a cold archiving. Be ensuring that this data is of the highest quality archival conditions. We also open up the possibility that one that one day these recordings may compete with mainstream uh, traditional archival archival material. The second archiving type, let's call this uh, warm archiving. Uh, this consists of giving back a part of these voices and sounds to the city for them to live on. As you can see on this slide, um, this slide, uh, the warm, the warm archiving can take a very, very diverse forms, such as artistic uh, and pedagogical productions, thematic publications, sociocultural events, exhibition, social sciences research, radio bro broadcasting, and so on. Um, but uh, um, that, that, that is for the examples, but uh, a large uh, permanent structure of warm archiving is our database. All uh, the various corrections uh, feed, sorry, feed in a, a public database uh, that is uh, freely avail available online and um, uh, all collected interviews, meetings, conversations are indexed to keyword. Um, and our database is now about, as you can see, almost uh, 19,000 mm -hmm. uh, sound files. Um, and it forms a, a dynamic uh, a biography, uh, organic bio biography of the city in constant growth and uh, restructuring. This is a screenshot. Um, you can uh, make some advanced research here and uh, listen uh, some fragments. And um, this is um, a fragment that um, we collect in a recent collection about gender. Uh, and I would like to let you hear now a small, uh, a short compilation of um, people talking about their the gender feeling. Est-ce que euh, tu te sens femme? Do you feel female? Par rapport au mot femme, est-ce que tu te dis femme? Est-ce que tu te sens femme? <rire> femme female? Female. Uh, mm, uh, yes, I do. Yeah, sometimes I feel very female. Alors, je, je dis oui, mais c'est oui et non. Alors, c'est très con, mais euh, euh, non. Um, Mais je me sens pas mal tenir au monde homme non plus ou mal. For me personally, I I I feel quite clearly female, but I also, yeah, on a very deeply personal level, I think I I feel very um, contrasted. I I feel also I've always have strong sort of masculine traits, and I'm I'm most happy when that contrast is is really on display. Well, I think it's something that can go into. Uh, waves or yeah i think it's nice to 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 be flexible about it and uh, towards yourself and towards others and yeah i feel quite in the middle actually but um 
but um, yeah, a little bit more female. <laughs> en tant qu'enfant, euh, bon, j'étais une fille, je voulais pas être un garçon, mais je voulais pas être une femme. Ça, je, pour moi, c'était vraiment euh, un drame et euh, j'avais pas envie d'être ça. Et ils avaient cette notion que c'était quelque chose de pas si naturel que ça. Quand j'étais petite, on m'appelait monsieur ou enfin, on pensait même pas que j'étais une, une fille. Et pour moi, ouais, à l'époque, c'était plutôt dur, mais du coup, c'était quelque chose qui était, qui était déjà là, genre ce questionnement, même par rapport aux gens et au regard extérieur des gens, déjà, il y avait cette ambiguïté, genre, hein, homme, femme, on ne sait pas, mais encore maintenant, hein, des fois, on peut m'appeler monsieur. Et après, pour moi, ce n'est pas, pas grave. Personally, in the public and in the world, I like to think of my gender as more contextual. Because I get read as male, female, anywhere in between by strangers, uh, uh, and by yeah by strangers in, in the public in the public realm all the time. So I and I don't take offense. Eh? This is not something that hurts my feelings or I feel contradicts my essential identity at all. I'm pretty sure that I don't believe in essential identity. I believe in socialized uh, and culturalized identity. Me. Ouais, c'est ça aussi, c'est est-ce que je me sens appartenir au... à ce genre femme euh... dépendant de comment on définit euh, la femme, <rire> sans doute, un... mais sans doute un endroit où oui, parce que j'ai certaines choses qui peuvent faire penser que je suis femme, mais j'aime bien aussi me sentir homme. Enfin... Alors, il y a, a s'il si y a une liste de, 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 de cases à cocher, il ben, y en a probablement toute une série que je ne, que je ne coche pas et, et toute une série que je coche. Mais But then at the same time, I think that uh, fem, politically, the history of feminism to me and the history of queer identity and the history of lesbian identity, for me, these are, I 100% align myself with those. So even if I... Um, can acknowledge that my gender has a certain fluidity, especially in terms of how I present. Politically, I'm, I'm very clear about aligning myself with a woman's movement, with a queer movement, um, things like that. I feel that part of my gender expression is, is maybe, yeah, to, to, to insist that this is also female. I don't know, to, to open up that term. I'm probably also a stubborn female, I don't know. Et, et je me bats maintenant pour que les notions d'hommes et de femmes disparaissent, qu'elles soient retirées des cartes d'identité ou de l'état civil, que tout ça devienne des données éventuellement médicales si ça pose problème, donc c'est-à-dire qu'on n'opère plus des enfants sous prétexte qui doivent ressembler à ci ou là. Moi, c'est ça que je, et je crois que c'est possible actuellement. Actuellement, nous sommes beaucoup, peu importe les chemins d'où on vient, peu importe comment on sont au sous-tôt définis. Moi, je veux, je veux aller à l'encontre de personnes qui se battent pour que les catégorisations disparaissent, qu'elles ne soient plus pénalisantes, qu'elles n'existent plus, parce qu'elles n'ont qu'un sens, si ce n'est de pénaliser. Et, et je crois qu'on est beaucoup vraiment, à comparer par rapport à d'où je viens, j'en reviens pas. Euh, de, de pouvoir vivre ça encore, une nouvelle révolution, et on y est. Beaucoup ont peur, beaucoup ne sont pas prêts, mais beaucoup le sont déjà, et voilà, il faut avancer avec les personnes qui osent, peu importe comment elles s'autodéfinissent. Et il faut créer des ponts, des solidarités, accepter les choix d'autodétermination, d'autodéfinition, qui sont les identités, et, et, et s'écouter au-delà de, de ça, d'aller de, à l'encontre des personnes, euh, des êtres. C'est ça qui est vraiment une grosse bataille humaine. Oui. So. It was an example of, of a recent uh, collection uh, we made here in Brussels. Uh, next to uh, the next to this, to supplement our database, we also have a sound map, a Brussels sound map. Uh, which is both a, a platform um, for sound archiving, but uh, also as well a tool. Uh, this map 
uh, is also completely participative and can support both individually recorded sounds as well as artistic and pedagogy pedagogical projects. Uh, so I'm waiting for the uh, connection because I want to let you hear some, um, some um, soundscapes of Brussels. So this is uh, our sound map, and uh, it shows uh, it shows um, how the sonic identity of Brussels uh, is something in constant uh, in constant uh, change, and uh, how the city can also be understood uh, by uh, through its sounds. So the first sound I want to to let you hear is um, called Little Hala. And uh, then let's hear, and, and uh, we will uh, speak about it then. So it's a sound by Emeric de, Tep de Tapol. Um, you hear the child playing uh, a mezwin uh, in the streets of Scarbeck, and it's recorded about 10 years. Uh, and why uh, did I choose this sound? Uh, because it, it, not only is it a very beautiful recording, but um, because I also think that today we wouldn't hear a child playing a mezwin this poetically and innocently uh, in public space. This, the next series of recordings I will play is interesting because it uh, illustrates uh, an Im important ur urbanistic change in Brussels. The So, uh, the three recordings have been made at each time uh, at the exact same location, but in three very different years. So, the first one is um, uh, from uh, 2014 and is by Amandine Provost.
So at the exact same location, one year later, by uh, my colleague, uh, Flavien Gillier. And then same point in 2018. Uh, it's it's a bit long, so I will cut. Uh, I'll take only a, a fragment.
So through these three sounds, you can hear the change of the boulevard en spac uh, here in the the bourse, the bur the, the bourse, uh, from a, a car highway to a pedestrian zone, and how it turned into a commemora commemoration space for the Brussels terrorist attacks uh, of March uh, 2017. So now for, for something completely different, a sound uh, that show uh, how the city can be very m musical. Okay. 
So, <laughs> bon. <laughs> okay, sorry, we don't have the last uh, slide, but uh, I uh, would like to, to conclude uh, to say a little words about sound as empower empowerment. Um, maybe during I speak again. Okay. Sound allows us to take into account the infravisible uh, and perhaps to save it. It is the heartbeat translating the invisible into the audible, and sound here is taken up as a spatio-temporal backup, a safe space for the multitude of stories at work in history. It is also mob mobilized as a stimulus for expression, a pretext for encounters, an apparatus for the creation of a shared world. For a share, uh, shared world. For a large number of people, unused to being given a voice and even less used to being heard, deciding to voice their opinion is uh, founded in certain uh, basic concerns. We could imagine that the microphone is an obstacle to speaking publicly, a cause for sus suspicion, but this assumption is uh, empirically unjustified. In creating the conditions for someone to take up uh, the microphone, we give them a platform. In lending them our ears, we empower them uh, and extend their capacity to speak, and to speak is to act. To record a voice is to give it importance, to catch it before it slips away, to save it from inaudibility. The microphone opens up a dual space of rights, the right to speak and the right to be heard. And uh, I, um, yes, I, I like to, to, to say this uh, beautiful uh, quote from Michel Foucault. Uh, he wrote it in French, so uh, I can translate. Uh, donc, euh, euh, le son euh, fond et euh, fond des creuses, euh, il inscrit comme un topographe euh, et permet euh, à l'histoire de devenir, comme le disait Foucault, euh, la connaissance différentielle des énergies et des effondrements, euh, des, euh, des altitudes et des... des euh, des, euh, des dégénérescences, euh, des poisons et des contrepoisons. Uh, thanks for attention. <laughs>